If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to the book of Matthew. We'll be looking at one verse. We're making our way through the Sermon on the Mount. This is the most famous sermon ever preached by the most famous person to ever walk the earth, uh, Jesus Christ himself. And so we're making our way through it. We're on the fourth beatitude this morning, and uh, we'll read chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you uh, for the way that you have um, held your servant up this week as we sing about... uh, walks and food and those things, Lord, that we take for granted that you give us. It hits differently when a friend is no longer walking with you and breaking bread with you. And so I pray uh, for strength to lead your people in the word in the midst of grief. And I pray for Joyce and Auburn and Ashley and Lauren and Leah as they grieve the loss of their father. Would you be a comforter to them today, God? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In cultures across the world, people have come to use language from the table, the kitchen, or the stomach to explain phenomena not directly related to it. Let me give you a few examples. You might say he or she is thirsty. Now, when we say that, we are saying that this person has this insatiable desire for a relationship. They cannot not be single, right? Or we say someone is hungry for success. This means they have this insatiable desire to achieve. We say things like, man, he or she has bitten off more than they can chew. Obviously, the image there is putting a portion of meat inside of your mouth that totally fills it so that you can't chew it. But we're not talking about meat. We're actually talking about a person who overcommits or is in over their heads. They have agreed to do something they, they, they simply can't pull off. Or maybe someone is pressing you to make a decision and you respond by saying, let me chew on this for a minute. You're not literally chewing on a decision. What you mean is that you need more time to uh, decide. Or maybe you get bad news and you might say that these words are hard to stomach. You can't literally swallow words, but what you're saying is that the news that you just heard caused a negative desire in your soul. Look, we do this without thinking. We borrow language from the table, from the kitchen, from the stomach, from digestion to connect with other things that we are feeling. Well, Jesus does the same thing this morning. He says, blessed are you or those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. In an amazing twist, he appeals to hunger and thirst. It would seem that he's talking about literal food, but then he puts righteousness at the end. Jesus is tapping into what we do in human nature. He says that there are some important spiritual lessons that we can learn from the physical hunger cycle. And here's the thing. This is so relatable. A a, a four-year-old understands hunger. Am I right? A four-year-old knows how to say, mom or dad, I'm hungry. They know what it's like to have stomach pangs and they know what it's like to need food. And the oldest of us know what hunger is. And so what Jesus is doing is by giving us this beatitude, he's taking these truths about the kingdom that are so complex and he's making it so simple that a four-year-old can get it. Jesus is teaching us that his followers will have a reorientation of spiritual desires and diets. That's the first thing I want you to write if you're taking notes. Here's the second thing, a main staple 
of our new diet is righteousness. And third, those who do righteousness, he says, will encounter a satisfaction that this world knows nothing about. All right. Now, before we look at this text, it's important to say that what Jesus isn't saying is if you do this, then you will be saved. That's not how the Sermon on the Mount is written. In fact, it's given to people who have already left the world to follow a Messiah up a mountain. It's as if he's saying, no, 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 no. Remember the first beatitude that blessed are the poor in spirit, not the mighty in spirit, not the strong in spirit, not the self-righteous in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for to them is the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus is saying that if you're going to follow him and be rescued, the first thing you have to come to realization is that you need a rescuer and that you can't save yourself. And Jesus is saying that if that's your posture, when you come to him, Lord, I don't have it all together. Lord, I can't figure it out. Lord, I'm imperfect. I'm unholy. And I'm in need of a righteousness that is alien of myself. He says, if that's your posture, he says, welcome into the family. And now that we are in the family, he begins to say, these are some marks that are going to define you. Those who know Jesus are going to mourn. We're going to mourn our own sin and the ways that we live inconsistent with who we are. We're going to mourn what's happening in the world when it's not working right. And Christians are going to be meek. Not prideful and powerful and lording power. We're meek and we're lowly. And this is the next thing Jesus is adding to his people. He says, my people will hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so let's, let's think about it. Here's the first point. Jesus' followers will possess reoriented spiritual desires. That's the first thing I want us to think about. Look, when you read the Bible, if you just kind of read it cover to cover, you're, you're going to come across this phenomenon where it's, it's all over the Bible, where physical hunger and thirst is connected to spiritual longing. So I'll read you a few verses. Psalm 42. We're going to sing this at the end of the service. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O oh God, my soul thirsts for the living God. Psalm 63, O oh God, you are my God and earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. Or Psalm 84, how lovely is your dwelling place. My soul faints for the courts of the Lord. Do you see that there's this correlation between food and table and stomach and digestion language? that communicating spiritual realities. But here's the thing about the Bible. It also portrays that same longing and desires in the negative, as if to say our desires and longings can be good and holy and right, or they can be perverse and evil and destructive. Now, here are the other passages in Proverbs 21. The desire for the sluggard, it kills him. His hands refuse labor. All day long he craves and craves. Or Ephesians 2, all of us who lived among the passions of our flesh were gratifying the cravings of the flesh and following its desires. Or 1 Timothy chapter 6, for the, it's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and has pierced themselves with many pangs. You know what pangs are? Stomach pangs. And it's the image that someone is craving after wealth. It's become their God and their pangs are in their stomach. Now, I want you to appreciate what Jesus is doing here by dealing with us on the desire level. This is so important. He's telling his disciples early in the journey that my disciples are not only known by what they do. They're known by what they desire.
And the next few Beatitudes, he's going to tell us, like, look in the Bible, look right after our Beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. That's a doing thing. Blessed are those who are merciful to people. You're doing mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, those who make peace. Or verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted. Being persecuted and making peace and giving mercy, that's behavior. But do you want to know what's before behavior? Is what do you desire? Now, why is this important? It's important because later on, Jesus is going to say, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. What? Now, what were the Pharisees doing? They were praying. They probably prayed more than you and me. They fasted. When was the last time you fasted? They gave money away. And Jesus is saying when he looks at the Pharisees, you would think he's just judging their external behavior. Good job, Pharisees. I see what you're doing. That is not his posture towards the Pharisees. In fact, he says, my people, when you pray, don't pray like them. They heap on big words so that they can be seen by other people, right? When they fast, they disfigure their faces so that everybody know they're fasting. And when they give money away, they ring bells and let everybody know they're giving money away. But that's not how I want you to move. When you go pray, you go in your closet and you do it in secret. And when you do good deeds, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. And when you fast, you put oil on your face and you walk into the world and don't let the world know you're fasting. Now, why is Jesus commending that? It's because those who fast and give and behave that way, they're not doing it for the applause of men. And they're not doing it to be uplifted by people. Their deep desire is, I don't care if nobody see it. My daddy, you see it. You see the difference? You see the difference? That's why Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that, you're just as guilty as them. And so what he does at the beginning of this beatitude is say, look, I want your good deeds. But before I want your good deeds, I want your heart. I want your desires. I want you to be ministering and laboring out of love for me and my glory and other people. Therefore, Jesus, right out of the gates, is telling us that following him is not just behavior modification. It entails desire, reorientation. Because when you reorient the heart and soften the heart, the desires will, the, the, the duties will come. This means that something has to happen to us on the structural level of our hearts. We get new longings and then we go do good works. Now, let me prove this. I want to press in on this a little. Over in John chapter six, you see it as clear as day. Jesus feeds 5,000 men, and that's not including the women and children. And after the people get their fill, they want to make Jesus king. And Jesus is like, no, nah, bro, I don't need y'all to make me king. I'm going to wait until my daddy enthrones me, his timing, and his way. And so he withdraws from them. And they go looking for him. And they can't find him. And they see his disciples get in a boat and go to the other side. And so they get in boats and they go to the other side. And when they get to the other side, they realize Jesus shows up. But they remember, we didn't see you get in the boat. That's because Jesus took a shortcut. He walked on water. And when they saw Jesus, they said, when did you get here? That's the wrong question. The, wrong, the right question is, who is this that walks on water? Who is this that turns nothing into something? Who is this that heals the sick? Who is this that loves us like this? Who is this? Could this be the one that my heart was made for? And that's not what they were asking. And then Jesus says, I know why y'all following me. 
You follow me because you ate your food and you had your fill. And the word for fill in John chapter 6 is the same word for satisfied right here. And so Jesus is saying, I see what y'all want. Y'all think I'm just a walking soup kitchen. You think I'm just here to reduce your grocery bill, that the Messiah is in front of you and what you want is more food. What you should be wanting is bread that wells up for eternal life. But your desires are twisted and you don't see me for who I truly am. And therefore you settle for what is less. Then Jesus tells us why. He says it. All those that the father calls to me will come. In other words, that's the key. The key is that they had not yet been called by God to Jesus. And Jesus was making them see their inability to change their own hearts. They needed a miracle greater than bread and fish. They needed the miracle of the new birth. And they couldn't do it to themselves. God had to do it. Where are you this morning? As you consider your own heart, do you see new holy desires there? Where you long to see Jesus and you long for his presence and you long for his people and you long to see your grandchildren converted and you pray and you're generous and you long for his kingdom to come or are your desires only for this world do you feel the war when you're in the crosshairs of temptation where you want to do right but there is sin that is holding you back do you feel the war or do you feel no warfare where you want to and make much of indulging in what is destructive? Here's what Jesus is saying. The savior that I am, it's not just behavior modification. That when you follow me, you're going to want to follow me. If God has turned your heart of stone to a heart of flesh, praise him. Marvel at him. And if he's not, there is a prayer that God does not say no to. And it's this, Daddy, I've messed up. And I don't just do bad things. My desires are so twisted. Can you change me? Will you make me whole? In Jesus, God never says no to that. Which moves us to the second thing that I, Jesus wants us to see. An important staple. Remember, we're talking about desire and hungering and thirsting. An important staple in our new diet is righteousness. Now, why am I calling righteousness a staple in our new diet? Here's the thing. Hunger always has something in its view that it wants to consume. Am I right? If you're at home hungry, your mind is set on some potato chips or something. If you're at home thirsty, if you're playing basketball and you're dehydrated, your mind is set not just on being hungry, but you're going to go to the water fountain and drink. That's, what, that's the language Jesus is using here. He's saying that when I give you new desires, you will hunger and thirst. And the object, the thing that you will want to drink and eat is righteousness. Now, why am I saying righteousness is an important staple of our new diet rather than righteousness is the most important staple of our new diet? Why am I saying and as if there's more? Because the Bible does. 
our new heart, when we're saved by Jesus, we begin to long for a lot of things. I long to be faithful to my wife. That's a longing, right? Look at Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the flowing streams, so my soul pants for you. So there in Psalm 42, the object of longing is God himself. In Psalm 84, how lovely is your dwelling place. My soul, my soul faints for the courts of the Lord. Okay, in Psalm 84, what does the psalmist want? I want to be in God's house with God's people. In 1 Peter 2, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. What is that? That's longing for the word of God. In 1 Corinthians 14, he says, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Look, like when we become saved, we, not, we realize that we're not just takers and consumers, but God has given us gifts to be used for the glory of the Lord and the good of the world. And so there's something in us that says, Lord, what have you entrusted to me that you have given me uniquely to do in the service of my king? That's a longing. That's a desire. That's a hunger. In Philippians 1, Paul says, I yearn for you with the affection of Jesus. That's Paul saying, I miss you. You Christians, I miss you. I want to see you. Second Corinthians 5, for in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. That's this image that our outer man or woman is wasting away. But our inner man or woman is being renewed day by day. And we long for what's on the horizon. I long to put on imperishability. I long to be glorified. These are all longings. It's as if Jesus is saying, hey, here's a plate. And when you are born again, I'm putting things on the plate that you will want to eat. You will want to want to worship. You will want my word. You will want to be around God's people. You will want to repent. You will want to be faithful. You will want to be generous. And then guess what he puts in the middle? Righteousness. Now, righteousness is. It's so important that over and over again in this sermon, he brings it up. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom. Unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom. Beware of practicing your righteousness before others to be seen by them. Then you will have no reward from your father. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Do you hear how much Jesus keeps bringing up righteousness? as being central to our diet. So what is it? You gotta read the Old and the New Testament. There's a reflection quote that's in your bulletin. Don't turn there now. It's by Kenneth Bailey. He has a, a really good book on Jesus through Middle Eastern eyes. And so he, he leaves America, goes to the Middle East and looks at the culture there and then write from how Jesus looks from their perspective, not ours. And so there's these nuances that he perceives there being in that culture. He has a beautiful four or five page working definition of righteousness, right? But John Stott, in typical fashion of John Stott, he simplifies it. <laughs> he says righteousness in the Bible has at least three aspects to it. One is legal, one is moral, and one is social. Now, the legal righteousness is our justification. It's salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, where God declares us righteous and right with him through the work of Jesus. That's our legal and forensic righteousness that's been imputed and given to God's people. That's why we cannot be right, but be declared righteous in the sight of the Lord through the works of another. And the Bible will use righteousness in that way. But the Bible also uses righteous from a moral standpoint. And that's the holy conduct which pleases God that flows from our new relationship with him, right? And so you might think holiness 
is righteousness. Behaving in a manner consistent with the Lord. That is called righteousness. But there's a third element to righteousness. It's the social. Righteousness is much more than what you do individually. It's much more private. It's much more than a private and personal affair. When you look at the law and the prophets, you discover that social righteousness is concerned with seeking man's liberation from oppression. The promotion of civil rights for all. Justice in law courts, integrity in business dealings, and honor in the home and the family. You catch that? Now, what does Jesus mean when he uses blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness? All of them. All of them. Do you hunger and thirst to be clothed in the righteousness that is not your own? If you do, Jesus says, I got you. And when he saves you, guess what? You're then going to be hungering and thirsting for the rest of your life to be conformed more and more and more to the image of Jesus. And guess what? You bet not stop there. Because righteous has a social dimension. Righteous cares about the poor. It cares about the vulnerable. It cares about the oppressed. It cares about justice and equality in our courts. God hates unjust scales where two people commit a crime and one person can get off because they got the right connections. That's an abomination in the eyes of the Lord. Righteousness, social righteousness says that the scales are fair for everybody and the same rules apply to everyone. And what Jesus is saying is what I'm calling you to, what this new heart of yours will long for is righteousness. Now there's a conundrum here because later Jesus is going to say, let him who comes to me drink and you will never thirst anymore. Let him who comes to me eat and you will never be hungry anymore. But then right here he's saying, blessed is the one who continues to hunger and thirst for righteousness. So which one is it, Jesus? Here's what we think is happening. You will never be more justified than the first day that you believed. You don't need to hunger for more justification. When God declares you righteous in the sight of the Lord, when you bow the knee to King Jesus, you're, that will never be more perfect than it is today. And so in that sense, Jesus is saying, when you come to me and drink of me, it's done. You're righteous. You're full forever. But those other two dimensions, your own growth and grace and your own concern about the world and the poor and injustice. Guess what? That's what I want you hungering and thirsting after until you die. And this is where I think the American church has been weak. We think when we read this, what Jesus is saying, only hunger and thirst to be made righteous in Jesus. And then we turn a blind eye to growing in holiness. Only be concerned with being declared righteous in Jesus. And we oppress people and mistreat people and promote corruption. And what Jesus is saying is it's all of the above. Make much of me rescuing you. Make much of growing in grace and holiness. And you care about this world and what's wrong with it. And you step up and you pray and you labor to make it more just and fair and righteous not just for your people, not just for your crowd, but for everybody. Martin Luther said this, 
The hungering and thirsting for righteousness is not a command to go crawl in your corner or to go retreat in a desert like the monastic monks. It's a call to run out and to offer your hands and your feet and your whole body to do what you can. Let us not look for nothing and care for nothing except the accomplishment and the maintenance of what is right, despising everything that hinders it. If you cannot make the world completely righteous, then do what you can right where you are. You hear that? <laughs> it's beautiful, ain't it? And it stretches us right. Here's the thing that I want us to remember. In a church like Redeemer, we need people who make much of every aspect of righteousness. We need people who are going to draw us back to brother or sister. You saved by grace through faith and it's not your own works. It's the imputed righteousness of Christ. We need that right here in the corner, the choir singing it. And we need another section singing, grow in holiness, love holiness, practice godliness. And that needs to be going at the same time. And you need people over here saying, but what about the world? Are we making it more just? Are we pursuing it righteously? Right. And what you have when you have all three aspects of biblical righteousness singing, you get this concert that is beautiful. It's not one or the other. It's all of the above. And here's the last thing. His true followers will experience deep satisfaction in their pursuit. Notice that he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. He says, for they shall be satisfied. That's, that's a future verb. Jesus means that satisfaction is coming. Now, this is different from what you see in the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Meaning like right now, when we bow the knee and are poor in spirit, we get the kingdom now. But he seems to be saying, for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, future satisfaction is coming. Now, how do we interpret that? I want to interpret it two different ways. I think Jesus intends for us to interpret this as a near future and a far distant future. Give you an example. Let's say you're hungry and your stomach begins to growl. From that moment that you feel hunger and those enzymes in your stomach send signals to your brain, however all of that works, you begin to say, oh, oh, I'm hungry. And what you immediately begin to do is to get on a quest to not be hungry. And so you might from that point sitting on the couch, walk to the kitchen, pull out some ham or some turkey, get you some potato chips, get you some lettuce, some tomatoes, cut it up, make you a sandwich, right? Now, remember over here, that was like three minutes ago when you begin to feel hung hunger. And then those next three minutes, you're on the pursuit. And then what Jesus is saying is, is you got to hear this. In the future, namely three minutes from when you start pursuing this and pursuing uh, food, you sat out and you felt satisfied when you ate it, right? That's what he's saying. That when we hunger and thirst for righteousness, when we be, that craving is there, we began to then go and practice righteousness. And sometimes we're persecuted for it. He tells us in a few verses. That don't mean pursuing righteousness always feel good. And sometimes we're in the crosshairs of temptation where we have these decisions. Lord, I, I, I want to do this, but, but I feel this war. Okay, I'm going to trust you. And all of that is like time accrued. But Jesus is promising, look, if you pursue it and persevere through it, I promise you on the other side, you're going to be satisfied. Your conscience is going to be beautiful and you're going to feel encouraged in the Lord because you have pursued me. Right? He's promising that. But he's also promising it in the far distant future. Here's what you discover about our appetites. When you eat today, tomorrow you're still gonna be hungry. And you eat tomorrow, and you still, you, you can't eat enough for a month and never be hungry again. It's not the way the appetites work. Now apply that spiritually. We wanna grow in grace and practice godliness. And guess what? We gotta try it again tomorrow. You don't, you don't get to reach no status of perfection in this life and you don't have to hunger and thirst for it anymore. 
You got to pick it up and try it again tomorrow and then try it again the next day and try it again the next day. And I don't care how holy you try to become. You're never going to reach perfection in this life. Amen. But guess what? A day is coming in the far different distant future. When you won't have to hunger to be more holy. You will be made more holy. And what about justice? We can march and serve on boards and legislate and advocate and do all of that. And we should. But do you remember what Jesus says? The poor are going to always be with you. And so it feels like pursuing righteousness socially that we're never, ever going to transform this world into this Christian utopia. It, it ain't happening. But there is a day coming in the future when King Jesus cracks the sky and he brings the new heavens and the new earth. And that's why Revelation 7, it says they will hunger and thirst no more. Do not read that as if Jesus is saying you won't have an appetite in heaven. What he's saying is, when I come back, you won't have to try to be more holy. You're going to be made holy forever. And you don't have to try to go pursue social justice because all the goons that are against my justice, they won't even be in this land to begin with. So you don't got to march. You don't got to legislate. You don't have to fight. Why? Because I'm bringing an entirely new world. You see what Jesus is saying? He's going to satisfy us in the far distant future forever. So I'm going to finish with this. Babies in the womb have it the best. You just, they just got it good, right? The temperature inside of their mother's womb, it's like 98.6. Perfect temperature for them to grow. It's not loud because sound is dampened by the amniotic fluid. It's not bright. It's like perfect. And scientists say they don't experience hunger. Why? Because all the oxygen and all the nutrients they need, it comes through the placenta and the umbilical cord. But that changes when they're born. All of a sudden, it's cold, and it's noisy, and it's bright, and they begin to experience hunger. And you take them home, ask any parent, and you try to sleep through the night, and they ain't going. It's like 2, 30, 3 o'clock. You're going to hear some crying. They're hungering and thirsting. And what we did in our house is we took nights. I think I had Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and my, we, 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 my wife pumped, and we had breast milk in the freezer, and on my night, i just get up and warm it up and go hold my children, and she did the same on her nights. And here's the thing that you learn when your parents, they're craving and hungering and thirsting, and when you hear their cry, you get up, and then you feed them, you change them. And then you burp them. And then you get to see one of the most precious sights in the world. And that's when you're holding your baby. And they're looking up at you. And then they fall asleep with like milk around them. <laughs> and then you hear this. And they're satisfied. Here's what your father in heaven is saying to you as you crave righteousness. He's going to enable you by his spirit to drink. And as you drink, your father in heaven gets to watch you. This is what it feels like to be in the arms of a good God who calls me to do good things, and I'm full. May we be people who are full 
and satisfied with his righteousness. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for your word and thank you for the way that you accommodate us and call us deeper in. Father, make us a people who love our legal righteousness, who love moral righteousness, and who love social righteousness. Would you do this for Jesus' sake? Amen. Let's stand and sing.